Welcome, everyone. On behalf of the Open Dialogue Foundation, thank you for joining us on this Zoom meeting, as has become traditional these days. Um, my name is Martin Michelski, and I'm the Public Affairs Director at the Open Dialogue, uh, Open Dialogue Foundation here in Brussels. At ODF, we are well aware of the importance of the independent judiciary, as we've been targeted countless, time by, um, countless times by Polish authorities, uh, among others, they tried to take control of us. They expelled our president, Ludmia Kozlowska. I'm sure you heard of that from the EU. Uh, but we won all those cases only thanks to a fair and independent judicial system in Poland. So the title of today's meeting is How Should the EU Support the Polish Judiciary? To help us answer, answer this hugely important question, we have with us our co-hosting MEPs, Ruzatun Tun, EPP from Poland. Uh, Sophie Indveld from the Netherlands and Michal Szymeczka from Slovakia, both representing Renew Europe, uh, and Terry Heintke from the Greens, Germany. Uh, thank you all for, for co-hosting this event, despite the plenary, and for everything you're doing um, to protect EU values. And a special thanks and congratulations to Michal Szymeczka, uh, the author of yesterday's resolution on uh, the establishment of an EU mechanism on democracy, the rule of law, and fundamental rights. Thank you on behalf of the Polish people. And our honor guests are Judge Beata Morawiec, president of the Temis uh, Judges Association and former president of the regional court in Krakow. We have some noise, sorry. Um, yeah, okay. Um, former president of the regional um, court in Krakow, removed from, from that position in November 2017 uh, in a decision against which she recently won a case against Justice Minister Ziobro. With her is Judge Dariusz Mazur, spokesperson of the Temis Association and member uh, of uh, the Justicia Association, who himself has faced a repression for his activities in defense of the rule of law, including following the testimony he provided um, in the European Parliament uh, in December last year on the invitation of Renew Europe and ourselves. Judge Mazur will also be providing interpretation for Judge Morawiec. And last but not least, Professor Laurent Pesch, who I believe needs no introduction here, but for those of you new to the topic, he is a professor of European law and head of the law and politics department at Middlesex University London. I dare to say he's, a, he's the academic champion of defending the rule of law in Europe, Poland and Hungary in particular, um, including writing numerous appeals and open letters to the European Commission, co-signed by the world's leading legal scholars and associations. Some of the letters I am honored to, to, to say um, co-authored with, uh, with me. Um, and also welcome to everyone who has joined us. I see numerous members, so thank you for your interest, for your support, especially during uh, the plenary. Um, I would say a warm welcome to the audience outside, but unfortunately we don't have a Facebook stream. But welcome to everyone watching us afterwards. And before I give the floor to the co-hosts and guests, very briefly, our agenda. Uh, we'll have welcome remarks by the co-hosts, then the keynote address by the judges, and a bit of background from Professor Pesch, uh, followed by an open floor Q&A for the remaining time of the session. Please. Keep in mind COVID safety measures. Don't breathe into your microphones and maintain a safe distance from the monitor. <laughs> and now, um, Ruja Tun, MEP. Ruja, the floor is yours. Unmute yourself if you're muted. Yes, I do. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's really fantastic to see you from the distance. Um, I don't see very well. I had a very nasty eye operation, so excuse me if one of my if my left eye is, eye is closed, but it should get better in a few months. Um, but despite of that, um, I'm really honored that we can meet here. And uh, Martin, uh, you uh, mentioned um, um, the co-hosts, but I am really very grateful to all those who are not co-hosts today, but join, and also those who, are, who didn't join, but who really take very seriously this um, issue of rule of law in the member states. Sometimes it's very difficult uh, for us because, um, because it's often um, our colleagues and friends from the member states uh, with which we deal and the situations are um, politically and also personally often very difficult. Um, so um, it's really very important that we hear 
um, those people who on the spot, uh, in this case in Poland, struggle um, and pay an immense price, we must admit this, struggle for, um, I would say, justice in Europe, really, for the functioning democracy, independent courts in the whole of Europe, because as we constantly repeat, every judge in any member state is a European judge. Um, and um, I think that also our presence, but many more um, would love to express uh, our huge gratitude to you <clears throat> and many others who, um, who really keep the level um, of dignity and independence of the, of the courts. And Martin mentioned that Ludmila Kozłowska, her cases, all cases were won in the courts. And you said because of, of the independent uh, judicial system, it's not the system. The system is already destroyed, but we have those heroic judges who, who, uh, who maintain their real independence. Uh, um, extremely high level of prof professionality. And um, here we will talk about Poland, but this is also true for other countries where unfortunately similar issues appear. So here I would end saying once again that I am honored and grateful and I'm very happy that our friends and colleagues from other countries join and are so involved in the issue. Thank you, Ruja. I couldn't agree with you uh, more. Uh, so now, Sophie Inveld. Sophie, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, organizing this. Uh, I don't know who's officially hosting, but on my screen, I also see Tineke Strick from the Greens and Robert Biedron from uh, the SND group. And maybe there are others that I, I don't see. So I think that's an indication that there's very, very broad support uh, in this house for um, in, improving things in the part of Europe which is called Poland um, and there are other parts of Europe which unfortunately are, uh, are effective, uh, affected uh, of course Hungary and I think by now uh, everybody is fully aware of the fact that the rule of law is not a national issue it is very firmly a European issue it is key to the functioning of the European Union it's a bit like uh, um, you know, you cannot say uh, I have gangrene in my hand, but it doesn't concern my foot. Uh, yes, it does. If you're one body, then eventually it will get there too. And um, I, I, I have to say, I'm at the same time extremely worried and dismayed at what's happening, because in Poland and Hungary, I think we cannot speak of a a functioning democratic rule of law anymore. At the same time, I also see reasons for, uh, for hope and optimism. One, of course, is the, uh, the immense strength and courage of the Polish people, not least the judges, but also uh, civil society and just regular people taking to the streets. I mean, that is, that, that's, that's really essential. Um, and something else is that I can see that the European Union uh, is very, rapidly becoming aware of the importance of this topic. You just mentioned the, uh, the excellent report by uh, Michał Simetska that was uh, uh, adopted yesterday with an overwhelming majority. Uh, last week, we, we saw the, the launch of the very first annual report on the rule of law covering the entire European Union, all the member states, which was actually the response to a call of the European Parliament uh, four years ago. Um, so things are, things are moving. Um, I'm sure that if you listen to Laurent Pesch later on, um, you'll get a, a much gloomier picture. And I, I agree very much with him uh, about where we have to go, but I'm, I'm slightly less pessimistic because I see even if we're struggling with it, um, the awareness is there. The sense of urgency is growing, uh, but we have to make our, the, the way that the, the governance structures of the European Union have been set up, that has to be modified because they're not suitable for dealing with this kind of issues. Um, I also think um, we have a, a, a partisan issue uh, and I, uh, I'm, I'm looking at Rosa. Uh, I think when it comes to EPP, <laughs> EPP is struggling with this. Um, and I, I see very strong, and not just the EPP, let's be clear, huh, because corrupted autocrats uh, exist in every political family uh, and every political family has its awkward cousins. 
uh, including mine. Um, but if you look across the Atlantic and you see the, the challenges to the rule of law, and I've just now half an hour ago launched a, uh, a, an op-ed on this topic in, in Euractive. I mean, they are there, the, the whole rule of law seems to, to rest on one 84 year old lady who died. Uh, and when she left the whole thing it risks, you know, falling apart. That's pretty scary. I think at least in the European Union, we have the advantage that not everything relies on one pillar. You know, the, it's easier to, to organize checks and balances. And as people are becoming more mobilized, as we are filling one by one the toolkit of the European Union, uh, I'm, I'm sure we can, we can put the genie back into the bottle. It's going to be more difficult for Poland and Hungary because irreparable damage is, it has been done, or at least something that's going to take a long time to repair. Um, but we will bring them back into the fold. It will happen. I'm, I'm confident of, of that. So let's keep our eyes on, on the future. And thanks to all the very brave people in Poland who've been fighting. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sophie, and I'm looking forward to reading your op-ed. Um, now I give the floor to the rule of law hero of the week, uh, Michal Szymeczka, please. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. I, I think the, you know, the, the heroes are the, you know, our guests, which will be speaking out to, afterwards. Um, so I'll be also very brief, uh, because we all want to hear, um, uh, of course, from the distinguished guests. Uh, most importantly, uh, just two remarks, three perhaps. First of all, of course, thank you very much, um, um, Open Dialogue Foundation, for organizing this event and also uh, the event we had uh, we had last year in the European Parliament physically, when that was still possible, it was also very well attended. Uh, and I'm sorry to hear that there were repercussions, so to speak, for some of the for some of the attendees. But I guess that's the times we live in now. Um, the, uh, the, other, um, the, the other point uh, I, I would like to make, and I, and I hear I, I share Sophie's um, cautious optimism um, uh, as far as uh, rule of law um, in the EU or the, uh, the ability and, um, of, of the EU to get things moving a bit, uh, and especially on the side of the parliament, uh, and leaving aside the, um, in, you know, my, my own report or, or, or the monitoring itself, I think um, there is also impressive unity so far on, on, on the part of the European Parliament when it comes to the potentially key instrument we, we have for arresting uh, sort of authoritarian um, uh, threats in, in Europe, and that's the uh, conditionality attached to the budget. Uh, and so far, there was a very strong message, there has been a consistent and strong message from the Parliament that, uh, that this, is, this is a red line, and, and we, we absolutely have to seize this opportunity uh, to introduce the rule of law conditionality because it might be the last time we could actually uh, do something about um, about corrupt autocrats, as, as, as Sophie put it. And I, and I think that's also very good. And I think uh, the you know the member states uh, got the message. So that's um, that's optimistic. Uh, and I think this is the fight that uh, will perhaps define um, you know the EU for, for years to come. Uh, the fight over the rule of law conditionality in the next in the next coming weeks. But for the Parliament, and this is also the question uh, posed in, um, for this panel, uh, I, I think um, many of you know and, and uh, have also seen it in the, in the debates we had this week that uh, there is a huge consensus and a huge majority in Parliament for, um, for standing up to, to those who um, undermine rule of law, be it in Poland, be it in Hungary, be it in Bulgaria, although there the majority is a bit, is a bit thinner. Um, for for uh, for those reasons that Toki mentioned, uh, and we'll we'll keep on doing that. We'll keep on reminding when it comes to Poland. We'll keep on reminding the Commission, reminding the member states of their responsibility, for instance, uh, on, in acting on the uh, the failure of the Polish government to implement the European Court of Justice ruling, uh, and we'll keep pushing the Commission to do what it's supposed to do uh, on on this and all other fronts. Um, so that that's sort of our uh, our our commitment. And um, finally, I, I want to say that why these why these events are so important, um, and why why having the you know the judges and 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 Polish also prosecutors that we, we had before why it's so important is that we often hear and it was also in in this debate that somehow there's um, there's a sort of a conspiracy in Europe uh, against uh, against Poland and against Polish uh, 
patriots, against those who want to defend Polish interests, who care about the Polish nation, and obviously everybody else who criticizes um, the, the current government is somehow against Poland. And I think um, not only is this utter nonsense, but we also have to show that um, what, what these uh, men and women who are here with us, they are doing, this is real patriotism, and this is patriotism, which is, of course, Polish, but also European, um, and not, uh, you know, not the kind of fake nationalism that um, that members of the government are unfortunately espousing. So uh, thank you very much again, and I'm very much looking forward to the debate. Thank you, Michal, and uh, again, kudos to you. Now, Terry Reinske, please. Now, how can I continue after the hero of the week? Seriously. <laughs> No, uh, just very briefly, thanks a lot for organizing this. I think it's very important um, to stay briefed on the situation. Um, I think there have already been several meetings and to me it's always uh, absolutely insightful to hear. Um, and I think that there is uh, a very, uh, well, I would say, uh, a saying that pins down the situation pretty well and that says that as soon as constitutional law becomes too exciting for regular people, there is actually a problem. And I think that this is true um, for the debate on rule of law that we see, because as much as I agree that it's great that we have such a, a vivid and um, very outspoken debate, um, it also shows that um, there are a lot of things at stake uh, in European societies. And I wouldn't say only Poland, but uh, also a lot of other countries. But obviously we are very uh, closely following following the situation in Poland. I also wanted to mention that just, I think now it's three weeks ago, we adopted a, a very broad report on the situation in Poland, which also uh, had uh, a lot of, I think, very insightful paragraphs uh, on the situation of the independence of the ju judiciary, but not only also on fundamental rights. So it was a very uh, broad dimension. And uh, obviously, as the colleagues have said, also really across the political groups, uh, the European Parliament um, has been, I think, a very uh, strong ally in the fight um, for rule of law and fundamental rights over the past years. And I think that this is also something that has to continue. I just wanted to make two very short political points that I think might, might also be interesting for the debate later on. First of all, I also wanted to mention the debate on the conditionality. I think if we had such a tool that had budgetary implications, this would bring a new dynamic into the situation that we have right now um, on the debate on rule of law. Uh, and for specifically the situation of judges and the independence of the judiciary, um, I think we have to be very clear about the fact that this cannot just be any conditionality because you can basically create a conditionality that can never be triggered and that has a tiny scope and then it's actually not going to be functional. It's not going to be useful. So we have the first trilogue on Monday. I'm the rapporteur for the Libre Committee uh, on this fight. And I think it's very important that we look very closely, not only that we get any kind of conditionality, but specifically a conditionality that can actually help in situations like this that will actually be triggered and that it will have impact on the situation so that uh, authoritarian governments cannot distribute uh, EU money anymore like um, they have been doing in the past. And the second point I wanted to make, um, and this I think goes also in line with, with what the colleagues have said and the rulings of the ECJ that have been mentioned. I think over the past years we have realized, or I have realized as, a, as an EU citizen, how precious and important the European Court of Justice is for the unity and for you know, uh, uh, staying together inside of the European Union. And I think uh, it is absolutely important to, um, to always repeat uh, that in the toolbox that we have, specifically also the, uh, the ECJ has been one of the most powerful um, um, tools and institutions that we could use in order to defend uh, rule of law and fundamental rights and that any attacks on the ECJ come there from Poland, come there from Germany, um, have to be uh, rejected and, and that we really need to strengthen um, the ECJ uh, as a strong European institution. That much from my side and now I'm super interested in um, hearing the, the on the ground uh, reports uh, from, from the judges, thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Terry. Um, and and uh, I, let me just say that being Polish, I'm a, I'm ashamed, and I guess my Polish colleagues here will uh, agree that um, conditionality might be the last tool left, uh, as we've already seen that Poland disregards um, ECJ even. So uh, as, far, as hurtful as it is, I, of course, uh, agree with you. Um, now, now our main speakers, judges Beata Morawiec and Dariusz Mazur, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much for giving us the floor. I will translate my colleague Beata Morawiec. Thank you. Witam Państwa serdecznie. Jestem, jak już mnie przedstawiono, sędzią Sądu Okręgowego w Krakowie. Hello everybody, I'm a judge of regional court in Krakow. I mam wątpliwą przyjemność w poniedziałek stanąć przed Izbą Dyscyplinarną Sądu, no, Izbą Dyscyplinarną powiedzmy, mm -hmm. bo tu trudno nazwać ją Dyscyplinarną Sądu Najwyższego, z wnioskiem o uchylenie immunitetu złożonym przez prokuratora. Um, I'm going to have a doubtful pleasure to face uh, proceedings in front of disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court uh, on Monday uh, next week because of the motion of public prosecutor to waive my judicial immunity. Może byliśmy na to przygotowani, ponieważ to nie pierwszy raz w ten sposób atakuje się sędziów. Uh, maybe we were prepared for such a situation because it's not the first time when judges are attacked in this way. Bo już w latach 2005-2007 próbowano tego rodzaju zachowań. Uh, in the years 2005-2007, when the, for the first time law and justice was in power, they tried this way of behavior. Jednakże skala tych zachowań troszeczkę nas poraża. However, present scale of these attacks uh, is overwhelming us. Sprawę uchylenia immunitetu mam ja i pan sędzia Juszczyszyn. The cases concerning uh, uh, waiving of immunity Tuleja. concern me and Judge Tuleya. These are both mm -hmm. pending cases. Natomiast y, tak jak jesteśmy przygotowani jako prawnicy do odpierania bezzasadnych ataków, tak nie jesteśmy przygotowani na to, aby organy władzy, czyli policja, nie licząc się z naszym immunitetem, wchodziła do naszych domów. As we, as a qualified lawyers, are, prefer, are prepared to fight with unjustified accusations, but on the other hand, we as human beings are not prepared for entering our houses at 6 a.m. in the morning. Z internetu dowiedziano się, a właściwie prokuratura dowiedziała się o tym, że dowody, którymi ja dysponuję, yy, są i przeczą wnioskowi prokuratora. Dlatego, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. dlatego następnego dnia rano po upublicznieniu treści opracowania, którego brak wykonania mi zarzucono w tym postępowaniu o uchylenie immunitetu. O godzinie w pół do siódmej, jak powiedział sędzia Mazur, trzech funkcjonariu dwóch funkcjonariuszy Centralnego Biura Antykorupcyjnego oraz prokurator przyszli do mnie do domu, chcąc zabrać mój laptop. Um, the next day, after I published uh, the materials, the opinion which I prepared in 2013, which completely undermines the charges against me. Uh, on the next day at 6.30 in the morning, the public prosecutor and two officers of Central Anti-Corruption Office entered my house. Immunitet sędziowski nie miał żadnego znaczenia. The fact that I'm protected by judicial immunity didn't play any role. Posiadali postanowienie prokuratora zezwalające na przeszukanie mojego domu oraz na odebranie rzeczy, których żądania wyda żądali wydania. They were in the possession of the search warrant issued by the public prosecutor and to take away the items which they demanded. Nie miało znaczenia, że na nośniku, czyli na laptopie miałam rzeczy objęte tajemnicą sędziowską. Mm -hmm. Nie miało znaczenia, że są tam dane osobowe członków mojego stowarzyszenia, czyli dane wrażliwe objęte ochroną danych osobowych. Mm -hmm. Laptop został zarekwirowany i cały jego twardy dysk zgrany na potrzeby prokuratury. Mm -hmm. They have confiscated my laptop and copied entire hard disk uh, as an evidence in spite of the fact that except for this opinion uh, which is the subject of the proceedings they were there also the data concerning the cases which are covered by the judicial secrecy the secrecy of the judicial uh, deliberation and the personal data of all members of uh, TEMIS which are covered by personal data protection. Uh, 
Żadne środki zaradcze nie dały efektu, ani obecność mojego pełnomocnika przy dokonywaniu zgrania twardego dysku, ani złożone zażalenie na czynności wykonane przez prokuratora. Dalej nie wiemy, co jest z wiadomościami zawartymi na twardym dysku w sytuacji, kiedy można było dokonać analizy tylko jednego pliku. Mm -hmm. In fact, they were aiming for only one piece of information from the hard, hard disk, which was relevant for the proceedings, but they secured everything, including this uh, personal uh, and uh, classified data. They did it in spite of the fact that uh, my uh, legal counsel protested during their activity and in spite of the fact that we make a claim against uh, such wide scope of this uh, of this measure takie działanie organu ścigania bardzo źle wróży na przyszłość such kind of activity of the uh, public prosecution office is a very bad mark for the future jeżeli nie ma znaczenia immunitet sędziowski, jeżeli nie mają znaczenia przepisy prawa, każdy obywatel może znaleźć się w sporze z państwem w takiej pozycji jak ja. If the judicial immunity and the rules of criminal procedure doesn't matter, then every citizen can stand can become in the same position as me. Coraz częściej występuje się z wnioskami o uchylenie immunitetu. Co, I to w sytuacjach całkowicie zbędnych, całkowicie wymyślonych. Uh, there are more and more prosecutors motion to, uh, to waive judicial immunity, also in the situation which are just uh, an outfit of creative approach of the public prosecution office. Buduje się efekt mrożący. In this way, the chilling effect is built. A izba dyscyplinarna orzeka dalej. And the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court still continues its work. Pomimo zabezpieczenia Trybunału Luks w Luksemburgu. In spite of the interim measure applied by the ECJ. Twierdząc, że postanowienia immunitetowe nie są postępowaniami dyscyplinarnymi. They say that proceedings concerning waiving of judicial immunity are not covered by the scope of the interim measure as they are not dis strict disciplinary proceedings in the strict meaning. Także to już nie tylko mój problem, to jest problem naprawdę dużej ilości sędziów, którzy żyją pod ogromną presją. It's not only my problem, it's the problem of huge number of Polish judges who are under constant stress and duress. Masowo odchodzą z zawodu. Many of them leave judicial profession. Chorują i już po prostu są na skraju wytrzymałości. Are getting ill and they are at the verge of their endurance. Liczymy na was. We count on your help. Thank you very much. Ja powiem, że ja dzisiaj uciekłam z sali rozpraw i że dlatego jeżeli państwo by mieli jakieś pytania do mnie to teraz ja muszę wrócić Uh, uh, one uh, last remark, uh, I'm during the hearings, so I will have to leave us soon. So if you have to ask me any questions, please do it now, because then I will have to, to come back to my judicial work. Okay, so perhaps before uh, I give the floor to uh, Judge Mazur, if there are any questions specifically on uh, Judge Moravitz's uh, case, um, please let's ask them uh, now. Anyone? specifically on that case. If, if there will be no question now, I can also answer the questions concerning Judge Moravitz's case because I'm pretty aware of the details of the case. Yeah. Okay, so maybe... Yes, may please. I say a word before, before Mrs. Moravitz leaves us? Yeah, yeah. Martin? Please, please, Ruja, please, of course. Um, no. just, just a word, sort of personally to you. Uh, I am also from Krakow, as you are. We are, and you know everybody, what keeps us still alive, those who um, struggled their life long for democracy, independence of courts, uh, free press, etc. in this hard time, are people like you, I must admit. I can imagine how terribly difficult it is and how... We lost you, Ruzha. 
I believe, Ruja. I am afraid we lost Ruja. Let's see if she comes back and um, connection issues, I guess. Okay, uh, let me just quickly write to her on uh, directly um, that we lost her. Okay, so uh, since we lost uh, Ruja, I just asked her to reconnect. Uh, but uh, well, I get, I get, um, I believe we we get the we got the gist of what uh, she was saying. So uh, congratulations and a, and a huge thank you to you, uh, Judge uh, Moravitz, uh, for your bravery for everything you're doing. Um, we cannot um, hold you here, of course, if you need to go, uh, that is completely fine. And as uh, Judge um, Mazur said, he knows your case very well, so I'm sure he can answer all questions relating to it. Thank you so much and good luck to you. Uh, you are muted, but just so you know, <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Good luck, thanks. Bye-bye. Um, Bye. So now, uh, Judge, uh, Judge Mazur, um, I will I return the, the floor to you. Um, I believe you have, uh, you have more for us. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, all members of European Parliament who are engaged in protection of the, the rule of law and independence of the judiciary in Poland. And we really appreciate your engagement. We really appreciate your proactive approach. However, we are pretty aware that your decisive power, powers are quite limited. And we are pretty aware that it's the European Commission, it's a body which should be much more uh, active than it is now. Quite recently, when the UK passed an internal market act a few days ago the european commission initiated the infringement procedure within 48 hours and set the uk deadline for 30 days to submit explanations uh, according in respect of the muzzle act in poland it lasted uh, accordingly in respect of muzzle law in poland it lasted two and a half months and two months respectively and nothing has happened since June when the deadline for explanations expired. Uh, this is very worrying when it comes to the question of priorities. Uh, and of course, the, uh, I understand that the UK case concerns one of the fundamental treaty freedoms, but the issue of the rule of law is also at the beginning of the Treaty on European Union, it's Article 2, and that is also the basic rules that I undermined in Poland uh, here as well. But obviously, it's lo it looks like that the money are more important than, than the values for the Commission. And it's very, very... Uh, coming back to the situation in Poland, uh, Judge Morawiec mentioned about the interim measure applied by the ECJ in April this year. However, our wise government and the ruling camp find the way to bypass this uh, interim measure in that way that they started to proceed with cases concerning repealing the judicial immunity. And that's the new idea how to find with uh, judges who defend the rule of law and independence of the judiciary in Poland. And in this way, the new uh, body was seriously activated in Poland, the newly created uh, um, um, internal affairs department at the very top of the public prosecution office, which was created in 2016. That's the department which is responsible for directing the motion to repeal, to waive judicial immunity in Poland. Uh, this is the specialized unit situated at the very top of the public prosecution office. And uh, it is designed in order to conduct um, criminal proceedings ag against judges and prosecutors. Um, it has exclusive power in, in this uh, respect. Uh, what is characteristic? The prosecutors who work there are not only directly subordinated to the Minister of Justice, who is the active politician, 
all of them were appointed by the Minister of Justice, but they don't have uh, the contract, uh, the stable contract to work in this unit. They are just seconded there without limiting the time and every moment that they can be sent back. With Darek, you are muted. You muted yourself. Darek, you muted yourself accidentally. Yes. I don't, I don't know how it is possible. This body really lacks any trace of serious independence. And according to the recent uh, opinion of the advocate General, General Bobek, uh, the, the European law precludes establishment of specific prosecution section with exclusive jurisdiction for offenses committed by members of the judiciary and the creation of such section is not, if the creation of such section is not justified by genuine and sufficiently weighty reasons and if it's not accompanied by sufficient guarantees uh, of uh, independence. And that's exactly how does the, uh, this uh, special body looks like in Poland, how it works. And the next organ, which is responsible for dealing with waiving uh, judicial immunity, is the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court. As all of you know, uh, according to the interpretation of the old part of Polish Supreme Court expressed in judgments from, um, from uh, December last year and Year. It is not a court according to the Polish constitution and not a court according to the EU law. Uh, in spite of this, this body is quite active uh, and um, very significant case in this respect is the case of Judge Justician, which took part in February this year. And I have impression that this case was almost unnoticed in Europe. But let me emphasize how did this case work. Uh, in this case, Polish judge who tried to follow the court of ECJ judgment of 19 November last year, so he tried to implement the European law, was suspended in performing of his judicial duties just for protection of the European law. That was the only one reason. But it was not the only one flow in this case. Uh, moreover, there was the situation that this case was recognized twice by the um, uh, this disciplinary chamber. Their first decision was negative. And according to the newly created rules of the proceedings in Poland, this decision of the disciplinary chamber was valid. There, were, there was no legal possibility to challenge this decision. In spite of that, Central Disciplinary Commissioner has challenged this decision and he won the case which was admissible by law. It's beyond my legal uh, imagination. What is more, the judge uh, conducted his activity which was the basis for charges in November 2019. In fact, he was suspended on the basis of muzzle law, which entered into force on Valentine's Day, 14 February 2000. So the judge who decided, the judges who decided, broke the basic rule of Roman law, lex retro non agit. We don't punish for activity which was not prohibited by law at the moment of commitment of, of this activity. So as you can see, within the decision, the very basic rules of both procedural law and substantial law were absolutely violated. And that now on Monday next week, Judge Tomczynski is going to undertake the decision concerning waiving immunity of Judge Beata Morawiec. It is the same judge who was the judge reporter in the case of Judge Justician. So we can expect anything from that judge under the condition that it is uh, 
that it is in favor of the ruling camp. Uh, I don't want to refer all points of my action plan, which I submitted preparing our meeting, because there are quite a lot of, this, of these points. I, I want just to mention about the recent situation which happened three days ago, which puts a new light on the way in which the system of administration of justice is administrated in Poland at the moment. Uh, a few days ago, it was published in the independent media that there was the situation that uh, legal advisor from Olsztyn in Poland applied for the position of judge of the regional court in Olsztyn. Uh, afterwards, he paid 12,500 zlotys, uh, which is about 3,000 euros, for the electoral committee of law and justice. And then, surprisingly, the neo-national council of the judiciary decided that he won the competition to become a judge of regional court in Austin. One of his competitors was the active judge, who is a professor of law with more than 100 publications on, uh, on the law. But he lost with someone who paid 3,000 euro uh, to the account of the ruling uh, country. You may think, is it a dream or is it reality? In fact, it is a nightmare, but unfortunately, it is reality of Polish judiciary now. Uh, some people say to me, uh, you shouldn't be so much engaged, take part in such uh, meetings, like our meeting, which is published. You, you risk your career, you can be removed from the profession. But if Polish judiciary is going to look like that, that you can buy position of the judge by paying money to the electoral fund of the ruling party, they, I don't want to be a part of such judiciary. It is ridiculous. Uh, and there are more and more of such strange situation happening in Poland, in Polish judiciary. Probably you have heard about quite recent situation in which one of the judges of Warsaw court refused the European arrest uh, warrant uh, from the Netherlands. It concerned the, uh, the parents of the children who kidnapped children uh, from the Netherlands, the handicapped child, and asked for the asylum in Poland, claiming that uh, Netherlands breached their, their right to family. Uh, when I have read, I, I'm not accustomed to comment uh, the uh, judgments, especially when I don't know the files. But when I have read this judgment, I from the motives of this judgment, I understood that in the Netherlands, it's like that. If you have the handicapped child, then this child is taken to the special mental asylum by the state. You have no way to escape such situation. And as soon as in this mental asylum, the judge, the, the child reaches uh, 12 years of age, then the child is subjected to euthanasia. That's, that's the uh, shortcut of the justification. You know, uh, I, I don't know exactly the Netherlands system, but I just don't believe that it works like that. Another argument of the judge... I, I know the Netherlands, I can tell you, this is all the filthiest lies I've ever heard. Uh, he also otherwise, said I, that, otherwise, I'd hand back my power. Yeah, I suppose so. Uh, he also said in the justification that the Netherlands courts are not independent, they are subjected to the Minister of Justice and so on. Uh, and you know, uh, the fact is that in this uh, division of court in Warsaw, there is only one judge appointed for recognition all EUW related request and this judge was seconded to the Ministry of Justice not, not long ago and uh, I'm afraid that 
That is the idea of future Polish uh, judiciary, according to ruling camp in, in Poland. That is the idea of the judiciary, which is very ideological, which is um, quite homophobic, which is based on strange prejudices. I also don't want to be a part of such a judiciary. Uh, so as you can see, the, the situation is getting worse and worse in spite of this uh, uh, interim measure. Uh, we can see the situation of... Direct, uh, I, yeah. I, I'm sorry, but we are okay. running short, of, uh, short on time. Uh, we'll still continue in the Q&A, but we still have one more speaker. I'm sorry okay. again, it's slightly our fault because we uh, okay. started a bit late. Uh, thank you. So uh, thank you. now I would like to give uh, the floor to uh, Professor uh, Laurent Pesch, please. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, the rule of law in Poland is not uh, simply at risk, uh, it is being erased. Uh, these are not my words, actually. These are the words of the then first president of uh, Poland Supreme Court in 2019. We cannot overemphasize the seriousness of the situation we're facing in Poland. Um, we are looking, to put it uh, briefly, at the consolidation of a Soviet-style uh, justice system uh, within the EU by the end of next year. So time is not on our side. Uh, really, uh, the house is on fire. We are looking at the consolidation of a system uh, where you have uh, Potemkin-like uh, courts filled with uh, fake uh, judges uh, issuing rulings according to the wishes and priorities of the ruling party, while prosecutors, also under the control of the uh, ruling party, are harassing what's left of independent judges and also are being used, uh, the prosecutors, to pursue, uh, persecute academic critics uh, among, or just uh, LGBT uh, militants. So the situation is uh, desperate, I'm afraid, in Poland. Uh, the violations of the rule of law committed by Polish authorities started at the end of 2015. So this is nothing new. Uh, essentially, uh, we've been looking at the destruction of the judicial branch in Poland for now almost five years. Uh, it's difficult to give you uh, the full background in five minutes, but let me just highlight uh, the worst uh, crimes against the rule of law which have been committed uh, since 2015, uh, just to, to give you a flavor really uh, what has been uh, taking place, which is just barely believable. Um, to be, it began essentially with uh, the violation of a number of rulings by the Constitutional Tribunal, then independent. Uh, they just uh, point blank refused to publish rulings and uh, point blank refused to comply with rulings. This is the worst possible crime you can think of uh, regarding a basic uh, understanding of the rule of law. You just have rulings, you don't publish, you don't comply, you don't simply care about them. Uh, why, did they, why they refuse to comply with them? Just uh, in order to be able to capture the Constitutional Court. So now, since 2016 in Poland, we have a fake constitutional court, uh, which has been described as a puppet body uh, by the, preside, the former president of the German constitutional court, which is unlawfully composed and unlawfully presided. I don't know whether you can just barely imagine the legal impact uh, in a legal system where the top court is unlawfully composed and therefore not it's not even a court. It's a political body uh, masquerading as a constitutional court since 2016. This is not simply my assessment. This is the legal assessment of the European Parliament and the Parliament of the Council of Europe, plus the legal assessment of the European Commission. So this is just a not my diagnosis. We have been uh, living with an unlawfully composed court. We have a similar fake body, uh, uh, which uh, uh, can be referred as the Neo National Council of Judiciary, which is unconstitutionally established and unlawfully composed. I mean, it's so ridiculous that they set up a body in breach of the constitution. The legislation itself, which is in violation of the constitution, was violated uh, when uh, they uh, filled positions. Uh, this is out of this world. And what do they do uh, with this body? They use it to, to promote uh, integrity-free individuals and appoint uh, legally tainted uh, judges. So we are looking here at uh, a wave of unlawful appointments. Uh, I describe uh, those appointed through this unlawful body as fake judges, just to give you an idea. Uh, these fake judges have issued uh, 100,000 plus uh, judgments. So now uh, the, the, the legal system is being contaminated, being gangrene from within uh, by these fake judges, unlawful, unlawfully composed courts issuing unlawful judgments. This is really uh, a, a situation of clear and present danger to the EU law, legal order and not merely uh, the legal order of uh, Poland. 
Uh, most recently, uh, the ruling party took control of the Supreme Court. So now it's not simply uh, they, they have the control of the Constitutional Tribunal, they have the control of the uh, National Council of Judiciary, but they also have gained the control of the Supreme Court. It's no longer uh, an independent court, so it's not even a court anymore because it's presided by someone who was unlawfully appointed uh, to, the first, uh, put to the position of first president of the Supreme Court. Um, they, this, to make it worse, uh, the, the Supreme Court is contaminated from within uh, with these two sham chambers known as the disciplinary chamber and the extraordinary control chamber. Just a long story short, uh, what do they do, these two chambers? They are used to harass uh, judges and they are used also to let the ruling party get away with uh, unfair elections and most recently unconstitutional elections. So the president of Poland was elected on the basis of a patently unconstitutional election, but the chamber in charge of reviewing the legality of the election obviously didn't find anything wrong because it's presided by staff individuals appointed by the very same one who was re-elected. So uh, uh, once you have the control of the judicial system, this is the kind of uh, things you can get away with. Uh, just to uh, give you just a flavor of the latest violations of the ECJ uh, case law, I mean, uh, the, the Muzzle law was mentioned. You cannot underestimate the damage this law is doing to the legal order. It is not simply violation, violating, organizing uh, the systemic violation of all the rulings of the Court of Justice regarding rule of law. It is also organizing the violation of all the rulings of the Court of Justice since the 1960s as regards primacy of EU law, direct effect of EU law regarding the preliminary ruling mechanism of the Court of Justice. Poland has already exited the EU legal system. Uh, it's difficult to admit, but to had Poland exit has already happened uh, following the adoption of the Muzzle law. And uh, the commission is in denial about it. They did launch uh, an infringement action uh, at the end of April, uh, just about uh, three months too late. And they're now sitting uh, on uh, the reply from the Polish government just to give you an idea uh, uh, of the lack of sense of urgency of the current commission, Franz Timmermans, uh, when he was in charge of the rule of law, it took him three months to get the Polish law on the Supreme Court uh, to the Court of Justice. Uh, the current commission has been sitting on this uh, for eight, nine months now. Uh, this is just not acceptable. The latest crime against the rule of law, the commission did not react to. The supposedly suspended disciplinary chamber, the one which was supposedly suspended last April, they recently adopted a decision voiding, annulling a ruling of the Court of Justice of November 2019. I mean, this is so crazy. This is so insane. This is so deranged. Uh, it's, I, I just cannot believe what I am describing here. Factually, we have a, a suspended body uh, voiding a binding ruling of the, of the Court of Justice about the very same body which is voiding the ruling. The Commission has yet to react to this. The Commission is also in denial about the violation of the ECJ order. I'm concluding now. The ECJ order suspending the disciplinary chamber is openly violated. Uh, I just don't understand why the Commission is yet to return to the Court of Justice and ask for the imposition of a daily penalty payment. Uh, they're refusing to even acknowledge the violation. This is beyond me. Uh, we need them to wake up. We need them to stop denying reality and we need them to stop hiding behind the, their uh, toothless uh, rule of law reporting cycle. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Laurent. Fully agreed, and, and just one remark, if I may add, you mentioned the ruling camps assault on the, the academic world. So a shout out here to Professor Sadurski, uh, defending the, the freedom of speech uh, while being sued by Polish State TV for simply stating what it truly is. Uh, so that's just by the way. Uh, so a very quick round of questions. Uh, Sophie, you raised your um, hand, am I correct? Yeah, no, I'll be very brief because I, I also have to leave at, at two o'clock. But the, 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 the issue that uh, Laurent Pech mentioned of the, the two cases, which are basically not being followed up by the European Commission. I mean, the Commission has the tools. It's failing. It's playing for time. Why? For the very simple reason that they need uh, the vote of the Polish government uh, for the budget. It's as cynical as that. And in, in acting this way, in playing for time, Basically, the European Commission is like the Mitch McConnell uh, and the Republican Senate uh, Party uh, in the United States, um, you know, being very, very cynical about power and making a trade-off with, uh, with the rule of law. Uh, the Libe Committee is, uh, is writing a letter to the European Commission, uh, urging it to, to act now because 
as the clock is ticking, the system is being uh, eroded day by day by day. So we will keep pushing them. And I, sorry, I have to leave now because I had another meeting. Thank you very much and, and all the best. Keep up the good work in Poland. We're behind you. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, well, we're supposed to have a, to have a full round of questions uh, for everyone, but we have to cut it short. But very quickly, um, since I already promised uh, one of our guests, we have uh, among us actually a former member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, uh, Kristina Zelenkova. Uh, you wanted to say something and I, I promised you you could do that. So please, very, very quickly. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you uh, for the invitation and thank you for um, the Foundation Open Dialogue uh, for your great job. We know each other, uh, Ludmila Kozlovska from uh, Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe, where I worked for four years during my period uh, when I was politician in, uh, in Czech Republic. Uh, uh, as I was not re-elected, I left um, uh, the parliament, but I'm still active uh, politically as well as activist and uh, believe me or not, uh, I would uh, never say that uh, I will protect uh, rule of law uh, in the Czech Republic um, as well uh, four years ago. It was not... Um, it was anything what I would not really expect. Uh, anyway, I am uh, um, watching what, it, what is going on in, uh, in Poland. And um, for us in Czech Republic, it's really um, very dangerous. And I found it as a, as a threat uh, because uh, we see what V4 is uh, doing on the field of uh, European Parliament uh, in in uh, in the Europe institutions, and uh, it is not uh, unfortunately, from my point of view, only about Poland, but uh, or Hungary or Bulgaria, uh, the, those countries which you have mentioned before. But unfortunately, I must say that uh, I see some similarities already in Czech Republic as well. Uh, what I have started to work at this moment on is uh, that um, uh, my foundation uh, started to investigate around uh, companies uh, which uh, belongs to state and um, uh, which are um, linked to the most uh, uh, richest people in Czech Republic and uh, the roads uh, are going um, to the top politicians in the Czech Republic and we have learned that um, these people, they are not only um, getting money from uh, European subsidies, like our prime minister, uh, but they are also getting money from our state budget. And we are talking about billions of Czech crowns. And I found it as a, a really security threat uh, in the Europe. So this is what we are working at this moment on. And um, uh, I am always um, willing to and ready to uh, support the rule of law or protection of the rule of our democracy and uh, human rights uh, in all our countries, uh, of course, Poland as well. But I would like to ask you to um, pay attention a little bit and give a look also to uh, Czech Republic, uh, if this would be a possible. We are on uh, common, uh, common uh, ground or we have the same problem and uh, we should support each other. So thank you very much for, for all your work for the floor that I could speak here because I think that also in Czech Republic uh, very soon it uh, will start to be a problem because what I see that we have, um, uh, we have institutions which are, which look like um, European institutions, but these institutions are actually empty. They are controlled by uh, people who are linked to the powerful people in the country, you know, and we cannot talk about the rule of law, democracy or human rights anymore, unfortunately. Christina, please, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. We have to really end. We're already Thank past, you. Uh, past Thank time you. at 2 p.m. Uh, so I'm really sorry we didn't uh, get to have a, a proper q and I'm sure we'll have more of those uh, sessions. Uh, so thank you to our uh, honored guests and thank you to all the MEPs that attended our session. I'm delighted to say uh, we had members from four major groups, at least 10 members. So as Sophie had mentioned, it's uh, crucial that the parliament and Europe is united uh, on this front. We will share with everyone here the full list of very concrete action points 
from the Temis Association. Uh, so you will know exactly what you can do to support the independent judiciary in Poland, uh, apart from everything you are doing already. And uh, everyone uh, watching us on, on Facebook, um, we will also share those concrete action points and um, summary a report on the current situation, the recent developments in Poland. We'll share it on our website, odfoundation.eu, so you can watch it there. And this whole recording, including the part which uh, wasn't uh, streamed, unfortunately, sorry for that, will be available on YouTube in the next hours or days. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to the MEPs. Um, sorry for, keep, for holding you uh, away from, uh, from the plenary session. Um, as, unless anyone has any very, very last words, um, no. Uh, I could only uh, to the Czech Republic say just a yeah. word of encouragement. Um, well, I was interrupted uh, when I was trying to say this. You know, we living uh, living in Krakow. I didn't know, frankly speaking, of a senja of a judge Moraviec. Those people became now uh, incredibly important public figures, and they um, and. Uh, we, we, you discover in such a difficult situation in your own country incredibly um, strong characters, honest people, uh, professionals, etc. Like here we see Judge Mazur and we have others like this. So this really is an optimistic accent to the, at, at the end of our discussion. And those people who are courageous, whom we discover ourselves, we um, um, have a huge support from, as you see, other members from the European Parliament, European society, etc. So I really hope that if we stick together, as you said, um, that we will um, stick to high standards of rule of law in the whole of Europe, having also such experts as Mr. Pesh and, uh, and organizations like um, ODF. Thank, thank you. Th thank you so much, uh, so much, Ruzha. Very beautiful closing words. And just so you know, if you ever need to contact the Polish judges, you can do it via us. Please, uh, please feel free to contact us and, and we will put you in touch with, um, the, uh, with our hero Polish judges on the front line of defending the rule of law in Poland. Thank you, everyone, again so much. And, um, and see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.